Welcome to the spookiest lesson of CAM 101. This lesson will explain how sneaky scientists detect particles behaving like waves. You'll even be able to calculate your own wavelength. In section 6.2, I explained that two phenomena led scientists to their understanding of light as a particle, black body radiation and the photoelectric effect. But what evidence is there for the wave-like behavior of light? The best evidence for light waves is the process of diffraction, such as what happens in a prism. The light waves change their direction based on their wavelength. Refraction of light waves in water is another example of light behaving like a wave. When a light wave enters water, its speed changes instantaneously, which changes the direction of light by a specific angle. In contrast, when a particle enters a new substance, like water, its speed changes gradually, and its path becomes curved. Sticking with particles, if a beam of particles encounters a barrier with a hole in it, they can either make it through the hole, in which they continue on their path unaltered, Otherwise, they are blocked by the barrier. But when light enters a small hole in a barrier, the waves bend around the opening in a semicircle pattern. We will explore this behavior in the famous double slit experiment. In the double slit experiment, we have two small slits cut into a barrier. We shine light at the slits and detect what we see on the other side. Each slit has a shutter that can be open or closed. If we close one slit and let light shine through the other one, we'd get the result you probably expect. One spot shows up on the wall, and that spot is brightest the closer you get to the slit. If we close the original slit and open the other slit, we see the exact same thing, a bright spot that gets dimmer the further away it is from the slit. But the really bizarre thing happens when we open both slits. We see a pattern of alternating light, then dark, then light, then dark lines. There are even places where the light was brighter when we had only one slit open. How can this be? Well, this can be explained by the wave nature of light. As we saw, light comes from little wiggles of electromagnetic radiation. These wiggles move up and they move down. The bright spots come from places where the wiggles from both slit are in sync or in phase. It's like when your turn signal lines up perfectly with that of the car in front of you. That is, these waves have a peak at the same time and a trough at the same time. This means they add together to make a spot twice as bright as either one alone. The dark spots come from places where the wiggles are exactly out of phase. When one wave goes up to be a peak, the other wave goes down to be a trough. These waves cancel each other out and lead to a dark line. This pattern of bright and dark lines is called a diffraction pattern or an interference pattern. And scientists have known about it since at least the 1800s. It's one of the greatest pieces of proof that light behaves like a wave. So, if the diffraction pattern of light proves that light behaves like a wave, what might we expect when we pass a beam of particles through two slits? Well, I would certainly expect something much simpler, just two bright spots, one behind each hole. So scientists took a beam of electrons, which have mass and act like particles, and sent that beam of electrons through a double slit, expecting to see two bright spots. What did they see? They actually saw a diffraction pattern show up, meaning that electrons from one slit are interacting with electrons from the other slit to either combine their powers to make a bright line or cancel each other out to make a dark line. These electrons are behaving like waves. This experiment has been repeated hundreds of times, even with things much, much larger than electrons. The silver ion is about 108,000 times more massive than an electron. And yet, 
When we shot a beam of silver ions into a double slit, we saw an interference pattern arise out of the other side. But this experiment gets even crazier. We can make it so that our silver gun shoots only one ion at a time. When this happens, we see a bright spot where the single silver atom impacts the detector. As we let more and more silver atoms through, more and more spots start to show up on the detector. But as they start building up, something familiar starts to appear. Wait a minute. This sure looks a lot like a diffraction pattern. In order for the diffraction pattern to appear though, the particles from one slit have to be interacting with particles that went through the other slit. And if we only send one silver ion through at a time, how can it be interacting with another silver ion that went through the other slit? What the heck is going on? But this isn't even, this isn't even the craziest. It gets even crazier than this. Okay, so silver ions have a charge and when charged particles move, they develop a magnetic field. So scientists thought to put little magnets next to each slit. And that way the magnet will detect which slit the particle goes through and they can check to make sure it's not interfering or interacting with anything that goes through the other slit. With the detector on, when they let the silver ions through one at a time, they saw something completely different. The silver ions only make two spots, which are brightest behind each slit. This is exactly what you would expect if silver ions were behaving just like particles. But then, when they turned the detector off, the interference pattern re-emerged. The biggest takeaway message from this experiment is that in reality, even particles act like waves until they are detected, at which point they start acting like particles again. Now, if the double slit experiment has tickled you, I highly recommend the book, How to Teach Quantum Physics to Your Dog by Union College's very own Dr. Chad Orzel. He explains more physics mysteries using metaphors that even a dog could understand. Of course, if you leave a physicist alone with a mystery long enough, they will turn it into some boring math. A man named Louis de Broglie derived the formula to calculate the wavelength of any particle. As the mass and velocity of the particle increases, the wavelength shortens. Now, you won't be tested on this equation in Chem 101, but let's calculate the wavelength of two objects just for fun. An electron in a helium atom weighs a tiny, tiny amount, about nine times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. And it travels quite quickly at about six million meters per second. Plugging these values into the equation, we see that an electron in helium has a wavelength of 0.1 nanometers, which is more or less the approximate size of the helium atom that it lives in. This wavelength sets the uncertainty of the electron's location. It's nearly impossible to know exactly where inside the helium atom that electron is at any given moment. Now I'd like to calculate my wavelength as I walk home. Including my backpack, I weigh about 90 kilograms. And let's say I'm walking very slowly at a pace of about one meter per second. My wavelength would be seven times 10 to the negative 34 meters. Meaning the uncertainty in my position would be a trillion, trillion times smaller than even that of a single proton. The takeaway message here is that only very tiny and very fast particles have any detectable wave-like properties. This is exploited in many uh, physics experiments, such as using a scanning tunneling microscope or a scanning electron microscope as well. And we'll see in the next section how electrons behave like waves in the all-important orbitals.